Welcome to the podcast that puts a finger on the pulse of medicine and technology. On this show, you'll hear from investors, industry executives, and healthcare providers on the science and business of medicine. I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib, and this is the State of MedTech. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. So this week, we have another great physician interview. Uh, This is with a orthopedic surgeon, but also a good friend of mine, Dr. Scott A. Sigmund. You know him as the man, the myth, the legend, the man with the mane, the fro. That's right. Hashtag follow the fro on LinkedIn. And if you're a clinician listening to this, don't forget that thanks to our partners at CMFI, you can get a CME credit by listening to this podcast and reflecting on it. So once you're done listening to this podcast, or let's say you're watching it, go and click the link below and you're going to enter, you know, just a few sentences. What did you learn from this podcast? And then just like that, you're going to claim an AMA PRA category one CME credit. And guess what? It's free. That's right. At the state of MedTech, we believe in democratizing education. And so we're going to foot the bill and provide these CMEs for you. So go ahead and check out the link. Now, today's episode is with Dr. Scott Sigmund, who is the original opioid sparing surgeon. That's right. He's a surgeon who deeply believes in the importance of staying away from opioids, uh, because as you know, here in this country, we've had a huge uh, epidemic of opioid uses uh, usage. Um, thousands and millions of Americans over the last you know decade have died as a result of this. Um, I'm not sure if it's in the millions, I'm definitely in the hundreds of thousands. And so he's very passionate about this. And so the FDA actually just came out with some new guidelines on opioid prescriptions and opioid alternatives. That's right. More, more importantly, is that when patients are dealing with paid, what alternatives do you have? So Dr. Sigmund's going to go into that. So before we get into it, let me give you a little background, Dr. Sigmund. Dr. Sigmund is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon providing comprehensive care to the patients at the Orthopedic Surgical Associates of Lowell since 1996. So he specializes in sports medicine and possesses skills and experience to diagnose and treat sports injuries and conditions affecting the knee and shoulder. Um, Part of his practice, he served as the team physician for the U.S. Ski Jump Team and serves the last 20 years as the team uh, team physician at UMass Lowell and is the past chief of orthopedics at Lowell General Hospital. Graduated cum laude with his bachelor's degree in biology from Tufts University, where he played varsity lacrosse and was president of Alpha Epsilon Pi fraternity. He then received his medical degree as a cum laude graduate of the University of Maryland School of Medicine and a member of the prestigious AOA Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society. After he graduated his medical degree, Dr. Sigmund completed his post-grad internship in general surgery at St. Agnes Hospital, followed by a residency in orthopedic surgery at Tufts Medical Center. He dedicated uh, to furthering, furthering his training. He also completed a fellowship in sports medicine at the prestigious Curlon Job Orthopedic Clinic, during which he was responsible for the orthopedic care of the LA Lakers, the LA Dodgers, LA Angels, LA Kings, Anaheim Mighty Ducks, LA Galaxy, USC football, pretty much anything sports related at the professional level and collegiate level in LA. And then in addition to his extensive training and practice experience, uh, he also contributed to numerous publications and research studies regarding the advances in the field of orthopedic surgery. He takes great pride in remaining informed on the latest state-of-the-art arthroscopic techniques for both knee and shoulder surgery, and he also gives uh, a lot of presentations and lectures on these topics. And lastly, again, Dr. Sigmund uh, has a fantastic presence on social media. If you're a surgeon, I really recommend following him because you're going to learn a lot about how do you tell the story about your clinical practice? How do you uh, position yourself as a thought leader? And more importantly, bring the best version of yourself online because aside from patients, there's plenty of uh, young uh, medical students, residence fellows that follow him and really learn a lot from his content. So you can follow him on LinkedIn. He's got a great Instagram handle as well. And he is the host of, in my opinion, the number one orthopedic podcast out there called The Ortho Show. If you don't know The Ortho Show, are you really in orthopedics? If not, that's totally okay. Make sure you go and check out their podcast. Give them a subscribe. They have fantastic guests on there. Of course, yours truly. I was on there uh, a couple years back. 
But they have great, great episodes on the latest and greatest in orthopedic care, ranging from um, industry leaders and executives, and of course, to surgeons. So that being said, here's our episode with Dr. Scott Sigmund. Enjoy. All right. And we're live. Are you ready for a damn good opening? Yeah, this is going to be really good. Well. All right, here we go. You ready for this? Welcome back, everybody. My name is Omar Khatib, your host and head of state for the state of MedTech. And today I got a special guest with us. We got the man, the legend, the one and only. You know what they say? In order to beat the man, you got to be the man. And right now, the man is Scott Sigmund, a.k.a. the fro, Dr. Sigmund. Thank you so much for joining us. That was a pretty good intro, right? I think that was pretty good. Oh, Mark and team, I'm in the house, brother. Thank you for having me back, man. Your studio's looking good, too. You're, hey, right back at you. Your studio's looking great as well. Since we last spoke, you know, what the audience doesn't realize is we recorded a great episode at the beginning of the year. And then when I went to go look at it, it was the audio was off. But, you know, you were in a closet. I was in a crappy setup. Our yeah, audio man. was off. But, you know, like – we, we upgrade, we moved up in life, you know? Dude, we're crushing it right now. I'm like, I left the closet, I'm in the basement with a full-on studio, and you got all that state-of-the-art stuff. I'm loving this Riverside FM thing, man. I think uh, Heather Hoover's going to be listening, our producer. We're going to check this out. I'm impressed. Absolutely. You know, that's the next thing I need to do. I need to talk to you. I need to get a producer, you know? Dude, how can I <laughs> have a producer? You're Omar Khatib, for crying I know. out loud. You know, I, I'm just Mag I'm just MacGyvering everything at this point. You know, all we got a paper clip. Get it all done. Absolutely, man. You know, so I, I want to cover like a little back, a little bit about about your background. So I wanted to have you on uh, one because the CDC had some new uh, guidelines for opioid prescriptions. But to give the audience a bit of a background, you know, I've been following Dr. Sigmund for many years. We we first met, uh, I think, back in 2020 during the pandemic. So Dr. Sigmund is. Uh, he says he's not, but I think he is. He's the world's first opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon, and he's got a fantastic presence on LinkedIn. He puts out a lot of great content. Plus, he's the host of the Orthopedic World's number one podcast. That is The Ortho Show. And so we've collaborated on a lot of great content. Uh, I've been on his show. He's been on uh, my show in the past at another podcast. And so I wanted to have him back to talk about this really big uh, issue and topic, which is opioid sparing drugs. But we're going to talk about a little bit of tech and some other interesting things that are going on. But maybe a quick background, Dr. Sigmund, give, give people a little taste of like who you are, where you're from, how'd you get into orthopedics and what do you do now? Yeah, I mean, I always give my shtick. I got to go for it. You know, I consider myself to be the original opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon, healer of knees and shoulders, left and right, host of the Ortho Show podcast, chief medical officer and founder of Ortho Laser Orthopedic Laser Centers, and, uh, and a whole host of other cool stuff. But most importantly, uh, it's all about relationships for me and developing awesome relationships through industry as well. But it's a pleasure to be here, Omar. And, you know, my, the hot topic is opioid sparing. And as you mentioned, the Centers for Disease Control for the first time in five years updated their guidelines officially for opioid prescribing. They did it five years ago. And what do they say? They said, hey, Doctors, you're spending, you're, you're, you're writing too many prescriptions for opioids. You need to write less. Okay, thank you very little. Wasn't really great guidance. It was uh, people were starting to do that anyway. But this time, they did a real deep dive on the literature, and they came up with with the premise that what we're going to do is not only ask you to prescribe less opioids, but let's give you some cool alternative ideas on what you can use instead of opioids. And they sort of bunched them into non-pharmacologic alternatives and pharmacologic alternatives. So that's the basis of this report. And just super happy that they finally have done something really actively to help us guide us with our opioid prescribing and uh, pay, man pay management. Yeah. And that's fantastic to hear because, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit late, but I'm fine. It's good that they finally got around to it, but you know, the opioid crisis here and I mean around the world, but let's just focus here on our country it's terrible. I mean, there there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who die every year, continue to die. We have uh, illegal uh, versions of it, specifically fentanyl, coming in uh, from overseas and going through south of the border, right? And the, it's killing Americans left and right. We never talk about that. I'll, you know, I got into a point, Doctor Sigmund. I mean, as as somebody who uh, I, I love, I love, I love this country. I love my my fellow citizens. If a politician says like, hey, I'm going to do something about fentanyl, like they got my vote at that point. I don't really care uh, about too many other issues, but it's a huge issue. Huge. 
you know. No, it is, and, and kids are still dying. I mean, that you that I mean, it's like any illicit drug that you're doing. Even cocaine now might be laced with fentanyl. Even marijuana may be laced with fentanyl. You have to be so incredibly careful. And you know, we're still that's the the illicit drug you know cartels that are coming in from either China or, or making their way in from the Mexican border. But we're still having a problem with doctors, you know, writing prescriptions. And, yeah. you know, it's incredible how addictive opioids are. I mean, I'll give you three numbers. This came from a CDC report a couple of years ago. But if you take, you know, 100 patients and you, and you give them a 24-hour prescription of opioids, a full-on 24-hour prescription, as many as six out of 100 can still be addicted or still on opioids at one year. If you provide them a 10-day supply of opioids, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it truly is, 13 out of 100 will still be on opioids at one year. And if you give them a one-month supply, then they're, they're literally one-third are still on. There hasn't been a single reported uh, research journal article within the literature that suggests that taking a patient who is opioid naive, that has a chronic problem, and starting them on opioids makes them better. So the idea of patients walking into a doctor's office for back pain or neck pain or arthritis and getting a prescription for opioids is the worst possible idea. And that's why I commend the CDC this go round because they're providing alternative options for doctors to be able to help decide how they're gonna make those, their decisions on how they're gonna treat patients' pain. Yeah, and I'm just kind of scrolling through. Uh, it's it's essentially the yeah the recommendations and reports for for the CDC guidelines for, on opioid opioid prescription. I'm just kind of scrolling through it and checking it out. But you know, one thing that I wanted to to ask you about was how did we get to this point? And and the one company that comes to mind, uh, which I feel like every single person in that company should be jailed, is Purdue Pharma and how they lied about the research about opioid addiction regarding their own um, their own medications. And, you know, doctors were prescribing opioids left and right like it was candy because they thought, oh, Purdue's research shows that you can't get addicted to this stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, they, the Netflix or is it HBO, the dope sick, you know. You know oh, yeah. Um, series that's on right now, if you really want to, to try and get a sense, it's a docu, docu-drama, but it does truly give a sense of how the medical establishment was literally, I, I use the word schnookered, you know, we were faked out as to what we did. I was told as an orthopedic surgeon when I first started in practice a little over 25 years ago, that what you do hurts. You know, you're drilling with, drilling with saws and drills and all this stuff. And it, you need to provide patients pain medication. They need to be covered with pain. You're going to use opioids because they're not very expensive. It's true. The pill may be, you know, not very expensive on the front side, but we all know how expensive the opioid epidemic is on the back side. And they're not very addictive. There was a paper written by a single person in the New England Journal of Medicine that Purdue grabbed that said that opioids, you know, will not be very addictive. And it couldn't have been further from the truth. And there was, you know, there were pill pill mills and really bad doctors along in the process that were generating money and taking advantage of people. But the, to be honest with you, the overwhelming majority of doctors were just doing what medical society told us to do. Mm -hmm. Pain's a vital sign. What, how can pain possibly be a vital sign? It's the most subjective thing on the planet. A vital sign is your pulse. It's your oxygen flow. It's your blood pressure. You measure it. You can't measure somebody's pain management. It doesn't work. And so all the whole industry was pushed in this direction. And so it was about 2012 for me when five kids out of our local high school all died of, uh, of overdose from opioids after having like routine elective surgical intervention. My wife is a local florist in our area and uh, vividly remember her, you know, doing the flowers for these kids' funerals. And I'm like, mm. something is just not right here. We got to do something different. And that's when I sort of started my campaign to really look for opioid alternatives. And, and that's where it all started for me. Got it. Uh, you know, to kind of guide, guide things, you know, I, I'm looking at the CDC summary and there's, I want to read this out and then have you kind of uh, cho choose your adventure, I guess. Um, so their, their main guideline addresses these following four areas. Number one, determining whether or not to initiate opioids for pain. Number two, selecting opioids and determining opioid dosages. Number three, deciding the duration of initial opioid prescription and conducting follow-up. And number four, assessing risk 
and addressing potential harms of opioid use. Um, one one thing I want to point out: you mentioned the the those those three figures about whether somebody gets opioids, you know, one day versus ten days versus thirty days. Correct. Well, correct. last time I went to the doctor, I don't think I've ever received a prescription for one day or 10 days. It's always for 30 days. And even somebody who I knew had whole shoulder surgery a year ago, they called me and they said, geez, Omar, like this is kind of freaky, but like, I, I just, I just had this like simple, actually it wasn't even a shoulder surgery. It was something very, very minimal. I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was like an outpatient, like one hour. Like procedure. a lipoma, like, like lipoma excision. And they gave him 30 pills. Of yes. They gave, no, he, 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 he called me. He's like, dude, he's like, uh, like I'm kind of freaked out. They literally gave me 30 pills of oxycodone. What do I do? I'm like, dude, flush that, flush that down the toilet. I was like, y do you need it right now? He's like, no, I feel fine. I'm like, flush it down the toilet. I'm like, because it's if it's there, they work really well. They make you feel good. There's a reason why people like them, you know. So, but of those four things, what what's the most important one to you? So the important thing for me is the one that goes before number one. Okay, and, mm. and that is, what are the alternatives that we can use so that we don't have to prescribe opioids? Let me ask you, and, and feel free, I'm going to put you in a, on the spot here. Why the hell didn't the CDC include that as one of the items, which is alternative treatments to opioid prescriptions? Why didn't they have yeah, that well, as a they, list of thing? No, no, it, it's not within the four that you're listing, because what you're reading is, the, you're reading the section where you've already decided now you're going to do opioids, okay? So if we back up the, the bean footage a little bit into mm -hmm. the, to the CDC guidelines, there is a whole section about alternative treatment options other than opioids and how they recommend those. And to me, that's the meat and potatoes of this, of this guideline that came out. You're right. What you're talking about is, okay – now, all of a sudden, now you know you're going to prescribe opioids. You have somebody that has a terrible pelvis fracture or some other thing that's going on, and they're, and they're going to need to be you know, started on opioids. And this is how you follow Section 1 through 4. Now, let's talk about the sections of the guidelines that were the, the alternative treatment options. And this is where I'm really excited because they actually do a deep dive of literature, and they separate it out to acute, subacute, and chronic, because these are different types of pain, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about acute. So acute pain is injury. Mm -hmm. It's procedural pain. It means perioperative. You've had a surgery, whether it's a lipoma excision or a total knee replacement or spine surgery. So that's the acute section of pain. And they list the whole idea of trying these alternative treatment options. What are those things? All the things that we think about. Acupuncture, you know, uh, movement, physical therapy. Um, I'm very happy to report. Everybody knows me. Laser made the list, and we couldn't be That's more awesome. excited. Congratulations! About that. And I want no, thank you. And I want to talk about that in detail. And then they move over to like subacute and chronic pain, and they specifically list out things like neck pain and back pain, and what are the modalities they can use. And they actually give a list of the things, not based just because you know the the try these things but there's literature support that suggests that these things work so they do make a strong recommendation on alternative treatment options in these guidelines so i didn't mean to to cut you off your no, point no, is please. absolutely correct your point's absolutely correct that you pointed out but the it's these these other modalities that truly make a difference and you know for me you know four, five years ago when i started doing this this whole laser thing, it was born out of the idea of finding alternative treatment options for pain management for my patients. And, you know, it was rotten tomatoes, dude. I mean, it was like, you know, country music down in, in, in the Southwest in that cage when they're throwing beer bottles at you so that, you know, you, you're protected. Yeah, you know, that, it's that true. was my experience. No, because I remember because me, especially myself coming out of the spine world. Hey, everyone, we're going to take a quick commercial break. If you're in medical sales, you don't want to skip this. So if you are a sales rep that's struggling to grow pipeline and a quota, you're going to want to listen to this. Or are you a sales leader? Maybe you're frustrated because your team just can't seem to get any traction at all. And, you know, you're, you're at the end, end, of, end of the line. You don't know what to do. So if that's the case, listen closely. I'm going to share a secret to not only solving this problem, but how you could get results at a scale you never thought was possible. So during the pandemic, I was in the exact same position. I was just like you. I was at a med tech company. We were selling capital equipment. We had a lot of problems getting access to hospitals. And, you know, we're a small company. We had just ended our partnership with the world's largest privately held um, med device company. Um, 
But the problem was that we only had four salespeople and we were also running out of money. And then the hospital shut down right in April because of COVID. Um, this really was the kiss of death. Uh, but with the support of my CEO at the time, I was allowed to try my digital medical sales strategy, right? And so essentially for about 30 minutes a day, I was the head of marketing back then, 30 minutes a day, I essentially used LinkedIn and a few other digital channels and strategies to try and get traction. So what were the results? In 60 days, 60 days, that's right, that's only two months, I was able to put 35 deals in the pipeline of a variety of different hospitals. Big hospitals such as, uh, you know, uh, University of Kansas or UCSF or Cleveland Clinic, right? And smaller regional hospitals, HCA facilities, etc. cetera. Um, and this was done, again, while, we were still, uh, while I was still managing the marketing department. So you can only imagine what my results could have been if I focused on that 100%, right? So what exactly did I do? Well, I knew that physicians and hospital administrators were using channels such as LinkedIn um, and so I went to the channels that they were already on, found ways to connect with them, engage them, and then through email, messenger, and a few other channels, I was able to get their attention, I was able to persuade them into virtual demos, and then move them forward, right? The results were remarkable. So since then, I started actually my own online training program called the Medical Sales Network Effects Program. It's an online course, and the results that people are getting are really amazing, and I just had to share a couple. So Gaida, who uh, works with spine surgeons, uh, made this post and said, hey guys, wanted to share a big win for me this past weekend. I went to a networking event not knowing who I was gonna meet. To my surprise, I was approached by a spine surgeon who's been watching my content on LinkedIn and asked if I could show him my portfolio. I have a meeting with him next week. I'm really excited and I can't believe I'm getting the results. Thanks to Omar and the Medical Sales Network Effects Program, uh, I've been motivated to really stay consistent in terms of putting out content and using LinkedIn. Another person, so if, for those of you who know the MAD device rep, the MAD device rep is actually a capital sales rep, right? So the MAD device rep um, shares uh, this great story where he says, uh, hey guys, wanted to share this win from earlier in the week. I had a meeting with a surgeon to discuss a new complex product and was reminded about the power of using LinkedIn in the conversation. I referenced some LinkedIn posts related to this product category from several well-known surgeons during the conversation, and this got the surgeon's attention. I was instantly able to build more credibility for both myself and the product using the information from this national peer group. Turns out, my, the surgeon I was trying to sell to follows those same surgeons on LinkedIn and couldn't believe that I did too. I now have a trial on the books along with more trust from that surgeon. These tactics I learned from the Medical Sales Network Effects program work just as well in person as they do on LinkedIn. And those, my friends, are just two of many great testimonials and I want you to be the next one. So if you're interested to learn more for yourself as a salesperson, or maybe you're a sales leader looking to level up your team, check the show notes below for a link to book time with me for a quick consult and to learn how my program can help you persuade at scale and drive product adoption in a way you've never seen before. So with that being said, let's get back to the episode. Out of the spine world, you know, the whole uh, the laser spine thing like left a bad taste in everybody's mouth because it, it was the most pseudo scientific thing. However, your lasers are are actually very very different and used in a different way, right? And That's correct. And and specifically, mainly because I've gotten more into longevity and 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 recovery and everything. If you can talk about maybe some of the biomechanics of your lasers, it it, it does have to do with stimulation and improvement of the mitochondria, correct? That's one of the things that it does. You're absolutely spot on. And, you know, you, you talked about spine, laser spine type stuff. Lasers that are used for surgery are cutting lasers, right? And they're focused right to the level of the skin where you're cutting, whether for the eyeballs or wherever you're using laser or even, you know, tattoo removal, for example. But those lasers are focused to a couple millimeters just below the skin. So they get high energy into a focal area that can be controlled. Our laser, on the other hand, uh, is a different wavelength, number one, and it therefore penetrates much deeper. So we're in the near infrared for all the, the laser geeks out there. You can't yeah. see it, but it's to the right of Roy G. Biv, 
you know, ultraviolets to the left that, avoid you. That's, that's an MCAT. To the right. I mean, that's an MCAT question if I've ever heard one. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Avoid you. Everybody remembers that. But uh, but the point being that if you get the right wavelength, you can then penetrate. We want to get into the tissues. Like orthopedic stuff is below the skin, right? Five, six, seven centimeters. That's where we want the laser to go. So you got to pick out the right wavelengths, which our laser does. You also want to make sure it doesn't cut anything. So we have a pulse laser. It goes on and off, so it doesn't generate heat energy. And it's then sp spread across a wide zone so that we can treat the entire hip or the neck or the back, all of these things. So now let's talk about the science that you were talking about. There's a bunch of things that laser does. There's photochemical things that happen. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite lines is I always, you know, hey, oh, hey Omar, do you believe in photosynthesis? Absolutely. It's not a trick question. <laughs> right. It's like, well, of course, you know, somebody taught me that in high school. Right. So I always say, like, why it shouldn't come as a surprise. We're a species on a planet that's been around for 300,000 years and we couldn't be more successful. Right. We breed. We're growing. We got this. We get every, everything about us is expanding. We kicked, we kicked so COVID's should, ass. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. So the point being that that, you know, we're a species on a planet that has a sun. Mm -hmm. OK. And. It shouldn't come as a surprise that a successful species on the planet in its deepest genetic code would be sensitive to light. And that's what we are. We are a being in a, in a species that's sensitive to light. That's why when you go out and you get a suntan, your vitamin D converts so that you can actually have strong bones. Everybody knows that. Everybody believes that. But mm -hmm. when, and when I initially talked about laser, people are like, what is this? I wasn't taught about it in medical school. It can't be real. But what does it do? So it increases mitochondrial production of ATP because the enzymes in the Krebs cycle, I'm killing you here, Omar. We're oh, going man. back to MCATs again. You know, the, know. the, the, know. the question we should all be asking ourselves is what should, what should have we, what should we have been learning when we were learning the Krebs cycle in medical school? And I think one of those things was, was lasers. Honestly, Laser. that 100%. lasers would have been would a lot more valuable to me than, than Krebs cycle. I just, 100%. I pissed off so many, bi I, I, my biochemistry audience was just like, screw this guy. I'm unsubscribing one star for the podcast. Exactly. Well, the point I'm trying to make is it's like, why the hell does an orthopedic surgeon have to explain all this stuff? But because I had to learn it because that's how laser works. So it does that. It increases blood flow to the area. It brings in the healing cells, which are called fibroblasts, which create a healing response. And it blocks the cytokines, which are these proteins that create Ah. inflammation and and so for the, the audience laser turns off the cytokines and for the for the non-clinical audience the main thing you have to understand is that a lot of what like when when I, like i just left jujitsu right i was in a little pain earlier part of it was due to inflammation because when you have something inflamed it takes up more space there's more pressure nerves get impinged and that's where with the pain comes and these cytokines which are released like we heard a lot about the cytokine storm during covid they make things worse, you know? That's exactly right. So we want to block the, the – so basically we're blocking the messengers of inflammation. And that mm. means that the body can then repair itself. So shining light, we're healing with light, the right wavelength with photons going to the area that stimulates a healing response. Well documented now in the basic science literature, well documented in the clinical literature outside of the United States. There are great laser studies from Egypt, from Turkey, from Russia, from Iran, from India, from Brazil, the Czech Republic, where there's great clinical studies where laser is more widely accepted. So my job has been to try and educate doctors on, on the benefit of the alternative pain and inflammation you know, management with laser. And so then to our surprise, last April, the CDC, comes out with their proposed guidelines, which were awesome. My mother calls me. She says, you were in the New York Times. I'm like, Mom, what are you talking about? She's like, read the New York Times. They're talking about lasers and you know opioid alternatives. I'm like, no way. This is so cool. And she was right. And so they proposed guidelines. It went through a public opinion standpoint where people could complain or describe or whatever. And as of November 4th, it's now official. Laser is listed by the CDC as an alternative to opioids for acute subacute and chronic pain. Hoorah. That's what I'm talking about. Five years of my life. And all of a sudden this just sort of falls into our lap. So it, it's amazing. it couldn't be more exciting. Yeah. It really. And you know, so great. you know, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it because that way I can absolve you from, from any, 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 any issues. But you know, 
I remember that one of the things that uh, 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 we had a, a, a talk about back in 2020 is like Scott Sigmund, man, cure of COVID because clinically, clinically, the laser showed promise when it comes to uh, uh, treating long COVID. Again, mainly because the laser helped uh, uh, attack and and suppress this issue of the cytokine storm. That's and I remember exactly seeing right. I remember seeing the pictures of of the I think it was the it was an X ray of of the lungs. I'm like, holy shit! Like it actually worked, <laughs> you know? Like and it was it was in it was in like it was in like I think July of 2020. I remember seeing uh, the yeah. photo either on LinkedIn yeah. or and I was like, oh my god, Scott Sigmund, cure of COVID, done. Like open open <laughs> let's like just open it open it all back up. Like why isn't there an ortho laser on every single corner? I'm the only orthopedic surgeon in the world that has a peer-reviewed publication on the treatment of pulmonary disease of COVID. And uh, that's awesome. unfortunately, despite our, our, despite our studies showing that, that you can actually, you know, I hate to use the word cure, but you can treat patients successfully with laser. <laughs> for acute, I like that. COVID. I like that pivot there. We, we cannot right. cure, but we can treat patients successfully. No, but you're absolutely right. And right. I read the paper, by the way. It was a legit paper. Yeah. You know? It was a totally legit paper. Nobody in America, everybody blew me off. They were like, this is still hocus pocus. But the good news is there were some doctors from India, doctors from the Czech Republic, doctors from Brazil that were paying attention to our study. And then they successfully used laser for a high volume of treatment of patients with acute COVID. And you have to remember, this is in the time when we had no treatments, we were treating people with oxygen. It was yeah, yeah. You know, hocus pocus we, we, stuff we were trying. Oh, totally. Like here, and I found I found it. So if anybody's curious, I think this is the uh, – I just want to make sure this is the right one. Yeah. So published yeah. 20, 2020 adjunct low-level laser therapy, LLLT, uh, in a more morbidly obese patient with severe COVID-19 pneumonia, a case report. Yeah, I remember, and it's, it was a great case report, right? And, and then it we also sense. wrote a paper – yeah, we did a controlled trial too. We had another ten patients that went in as well. But you know, look at the end of the day, I, I keep you know I, I'm just proud of the fact that we've been plugging away, really trying to provide this alternative treatment strategy for patients. So you know, my business, which is called Ortho Laser with the Peak Laser Centers, we have thirteen. I'm sorry, fourteen centers open. The fifteenth is opening next week, and we literally have another thirteen that are in the queue to open. So. Finally, we're breaking through, you and, know, and, and I have, you know, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Oh, no, yeah. And I was going to say, because I just, you know, my audience, what they're really used to is that I'm pretty like ruthless when it comes to uh, like who I have on and then like what they're, what they're allowed to talk about. One of the reasons why I want to have you on was to talk about ortho laser. And the main reason why is that I can't help but gravitate towards alternatives to medical treatment that are better for the patient and are you know, and get you off a farmer. Like, for example, I haven't had anybody on yet, but in my, uh, a, like the, the last podcast I helped start, we talked a lot about TMS, which is transcran transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is great for patients with anxiety, PTSD, even ADD. So they can do that instead of be on medications, right? You know, like- It's one of my favorite, yeah, it's great, you know, of course. Yeah, because like, here's the other thing. You can, let's just say- you know, I, just so everybody knows, I'm very happy. I've never had any suicidal thoughts. I have no plan on ever killing myself. But like, here's something that I don't think Big Pharma ever has an interest to do. Hey, let's do a long-term study of what the effects are of opioid usage. If somebody survives, right? Like, we'll never know. I can only imagine it's bad, right? So, yeah, there's there's a subset of patients that are actually able to be on chronic opioids and function, and uh, they can still hold jobs. They actually still drive and uh, do a bunch of other things. But that's a pretty it's a pretty small group. They're very vocal uh, that they don't want their opioids removed. And honestly, that's not my goal either. You know, I am I am very clear. I am not against all opioids. I think for patients that are near death or have you know cancer or even patients they have that their have place. Had chronic opioids. And even patients that are currently on chronic opioids, I'm not saying that we have to restrict your your use. What I'm saying is we want to try and and, and prevent the next wave of patients who begin who, like those who five kids. Opioid That's exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah, like so. That, like if you're that's young, been the mission. do you? Yeah, the 100. percent Like if for for young people, like collegiate athletes, like do they technically need opioids, or if they're young enough, can they can they benefit from things like laser therapy, some physical therapy, right? And again, to your point pain is not a vital sign. It's not. It's subjective. You cannot measure it, 
right? Those, those athletes that you're talking about are some of the ones that are most prone to opioid addiction, right? These are high end athletes. They're why used why to, is that, know, by the way? They're used to. I think it's something that have to. It's probably in their genetic predisposition. Uh, but it has something to do with the fact that they don't fail. They push themselves hard. They're mm. looking for ways to get better, right? And th so they're always looking to try and, and, and push the envelope. And so they're, those are ones that we oftentimes will see. And and so, you know, when I look at it and I have a conversation with a patient, I say, look, here's what you got. You know, maybe it's surgery for you, but we could certainly try an operative approach. What if we tried this laser where there's there's no injections, there's no medications, there's no possible side effects, you know, and our results are 80% successful for clinical outcomes. I mean, it's hard not to want to do that. I, you know, in a perfect world, uh, you know, commercial insurance and CMS and Medicare will pay for this, but that's not happening anytime soon. So it is a patient pay model, but we, we, but it's, we make it's, it so it's that very the, affordable most people though. Can afford it. It's extremely yeah, 60 affordable. To six, 60 to $70 a treatment. It's like a copay for physical therapy. I think, and to get out of pain, I'm like, a, a, for, you know, or get back on the field faster. Why not? Right? No, a hundred, a hundred percent. And, you know, I, we talked about this a couple of years ago and I, I still, I see it more and more, which is people really taking charge of their healthcare. Like I have, you know, right now as an entrepreneur, like I, I've had to buy my own health insurance and everything, but then, you know, I've gotten smarter about certain things. Guys like, okay, Instead of me waiting for something bad to happen, let, what what are some preventative things I can do for like longevity, right? You know, and so like for example, uh, there's certain uh, physical therapy and treatment that I go to now that I pay I pay out of pocket for because it's it's preventative and it's and I'm I'm getting time back versus waiting till it gets to a point where it's really bad. That's when it gets expensive, you know. And, and look, the bottom line is in, in the United States right now, just about every single patient is used to having some sort of out-of-pocket cost for health care, whether it's a high deductible PPO plan or an HSA mm -hmm. plan or even a regular HMO. You have deductibles, you have co-pays. And so people are used to bringing their credit card to see the doctor. It's just the nature of what we do at this point. Um, what we're, not, we're, we're just trying to, to, to provide an alternative treatment option that's reasonably affordable that keeps people moving, that helps them to eliminate their pain and not have all of the side effects associated with a lot of the typical pharmacologic treatments associated with pain management. What's what's the normal route for, let's say, like I can you walk us through just like, um, so like one of the things on, on the CDC guideline I was scrolling through is that it seems like it really does, it emphasizes the importance of, and I'm quoting them here, a person-centered care where there's a provider and patient developing a plan, a plan for treatment, right? So the provider, in this case, like not every orthopedic surgeon ha has an ortho laser or knows about it. And so can you, can you, can you give us like a, a general scenario of how, let's say, your, 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 your average orthopedic surgeon who does a case, like, like what's, how does this go? How, do, how, 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 does, how should this look, you know? So I'm hoping there's going to be a lot of FOMO out there in the orthopedic surgeons, and it's actually happening at this point right now. So when we're opening these ortho laser centers, like we have one, another one opening in Massachusetts, and it's got all of the leading orthopedic surgeons in Boston that have now joined this because the first four or five joined, and then the other seven or eight who all know each other were like, hey, Scott, what's going on with this ortho laser thing? Can I still get in? So the point is, I guess what I'm trying to make is that it's our job to try and make ortho lasers available in every community across the country. And that, as the chief medical officer and founder, that's what I'm trying to do. But let's say there is a center in the area. You know, you go and see your doctor, you complain of, let's say, tennis elbow, and the doctor should be able to provide you alternative treatment options or give you a list. Do you want to do a cortisone shot? Do you want to do physical therapy? Do you want to do laser? Do you want to do surgery? And then that, amongst that menu of options, you know, the patient then helps to, to make a decision. So that's one way one way for a patient to get in is to basically go to your doctor and, and talk about it. He presents options, he writes a script, and you go get laser. The other way in which we're really excited now is that we want to try and expand out to more of the, of the community so that you don't have to have the rigid transaction of going to see a doctor and making an appointment and leaving work yeah. for two and a half hours. A lot of right? people it just sucks. want to go straight so, Straight and just like yeah, they want know? to go straight in, right? So yeah. so now if you call Ortho Laser, we're we're beta testing a new plan where we're using asynchronous questionnaires with uh, telemedicine. 
So oh, what does that mean? So perfect. Okay. So we, ha we have a questionnaire that's maybe 15 questions, talks about really important stuff. You know, do you have cancer? Are you on blood thinners? Where's your pain, et cetera? All of these things. That questionnaire gets sent to a nurse practitioner who is licensed in the state. She reviews the questionnaire and then she makes a determination if you're a candidate for laser. And within a couple hours, you get notified back. Yes, you're a candidate for laser. And then we call you and we set you up for a laser treatment. But when are you, so, when are you not a candidate for, for laser? The only true you know, contraindication for laser is for patients that have bloodborne cancers. Mm. Things like leukemias, for example. There have been some reports in the literature that some cell lines, leuke you know, cancer cell lines, bloodborne, uh, will activate more under the setting of laser, which makes sense. Um, you know, and so we want to avoid laser in those patients. But if you have a solid tumor that's known and it's away from the zone of where your your shoulder hurts, sure, you can still have laser. If you have a pacemaker, if you have a spinal cord stimulator, you can still have laser. So there's very few true contraindications for laser treatment. Okay. I, I want to take us a, like a little bit off this path for a second, um, like, sure. but, but with re regards to, 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 to lasers here, you know, there's more and more of an interest in this, this whole world of like biohacking and longevity and stuff. Right. And so if you look at, for example, uh, like from, for, for my business, I deal with a lot of medical salespeople being a medical sales rep is a brutally laborious job. Like it's, it's, it's hard on your body. Right. And so these, they're, they're, it's like being a pro athlete right? You have to take care of your body. Would it be out of the question? Like, is this a good idea or a bad idea? If you have like a rep in their twenties, let's say, or thirties, they're in good shape and everything, but they want to go to an ortho laser laser center to get their, let's say their knees and shoulders and some of their joints lasered once a month, just, just to kind of enhance that mitochondrial function, but they don't have any pain or anything. It's just like more maintenance. Is that, is that okay? Well, it, it's the first, first laser is not going to hurt. I mean, it, it just doesn't, the, you know, our pulsed laser, it's called a multi-wave lock system. MLS laser has been around uh, for about 11 years, FDA, you know, cleared, and there's not a single incidence of significant complication associated with it. So that scenario is a little bit, you know, much to say that, you know, I like for you, I know you like to jump in a huge tub of ice, right? Because, you know, I'm really asking this seen... question for myself because I because I know you have a center here in SoCal. So I was like, I was like, if they if they let me do it, I'll go do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think where we see maintenance therapy more practical and, and no disrespect, I want to appreciate it. <laughs> no, no, totally. but but the, what we see is the patient that comes in and has 12 laser sessions for their knee osteoarthritis, and they skip out after their 12th treatment. They're like, I can't believe how great my knee feels, uh, and they have significant arthritis. We see it on an X-ray. We know it's there. That patient's a great candidate to do maintenance treatment, and they may elect to come in twice a month after that to maintain this equilibrium or improvement in their metabolism that's happened at the local level. That, to me, is a really good indication. Now, for you, we're going to want to get the coffin so we can do can do TBLT, total body laser therapy. Is that, is that, is that a thing? Well, there there are some LED. Uh, you know, LED is different than laser. It's 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 a more broad, uncollimated light source. But because yes, your ortho these, laser these device, it looks it looks like a miniature C arm, right? Because it's just focused. Yes. So, but you have one that's like it's like a box. It's like it's like red light therapy, but like a like an actual box. Why why are you telling about this? Why are you telling me this now? <laughs> well, why do we don't so first and foremost i don't manufacture lasers we we use a company called asa laser that manufactures our lasers out of italy uh, uh they i don't think they have a coffin but one of the one of the competing laser companies it's not laser it's red light therapy or led therapy uh, but you can sit in one of these devices with eyeglasses on and having total body laser therapy it may be coming we'll see got it Got it. But in the meantime, it just sounds like, like, for example, I tweaked my back, my, you know, it feels, feels a little discomfort there for a few days. Then I can say, I, I might go and fill out the ortho laser questionnaire. And the reason why I mentioned this, I mean, yeah, selfishly for myself, but there's a lot of like, and I've, I've dealt with them because they're in my community. There's primary care physicians um, who, who deal with patients all the time. And they just don't know, mainly because one, the orthopedic community sometimes doesn't do a good job, you know, educating their primary care physicians on like, hey, here's what you got to look for. And so a primary care physician is like, okay, well, this person's not in enough pain to refer him to orthopedic surgeon. Maybe I can send him to a physical therapist. And then they just like go get massage or something. 
You know, like- so here's so this is perfect. Great segue. Thank you very much. On December first, <laughs> That's why is the best okay. show, man? <laughs> yeah, you're the best dude. You're like you just you're just like a sensei. You figure the whole thing out. But uh, so so December first, I'm gonna I'm gonna meet with the medical staff at my local hospital. I'm providing you know cocktails and dinner, and I'm specifically going to go over the CDC updated guidelines on opioid prescribing. And I'll bet you half the people that are going to be in the room don't even know about it. But we're going to educate them on these options, right? Because really, the, the primary care doctors are the ones are, are purveyors of pain, right? That's who you go to. If something hurts, you don't just call the orthopedic surgeon. Usually, you go and see your primary care doctor. That's what we've been trained to do. And they're not; they don't have; they didn't have a lot of options. They just, you know, they. So now these new guidelines provides a lot of options, including the use of laser, other modalities such as acupuncture, these sorts of things. So, you know. Educating these doctors is imperative so that it trickles down so that the patients are going to get great alternative pain management as well. Got it. That's fantastic. When are you going to do that talk? It's December 1st. It's going to be local. It's not going to be uh, recorded. That's going to be, a, but it's here in Boston. No, that's, for the that's okay. Because then, yeah. then you can just take that deck and come back on my show and let's do, I think we should do a live webinar, a CME webinar on my show would uh, for this. We'd love to do that. Okay. I'll, we'll, we'll love to do that. Perfect. We'll, uh, I'll set that up with you. Um, yeah. Being, being mindful of your time. And again, it's late this. So I appreciate you. Like you just did a case earlier and jumping yeah, on the show, but I have to ask because one, you are an orthopedic surgeon, so orthopedic surgeons are are fairly a lot more entrepreneurial and tech savvy than most other surgeons. But what are some cool like tech that's out there that you're interested in? Whether you use the tech or not, I mean, you can share your disclosures; doesn't matter for me. But like, what what's what's kind of caught your eye recently? What's been exciting? So the the most exciting thing for me at this very moment is a new company called Caliber, and it's artificial intelligence in arthroscopy. So okay. the bottom line, so, so, so if the listeners, when we do arthroscopic surgery, it's this weird thing. It's like we're gaming, okay? And so what that means is we're looking away from where the surgical field is, and we have this three-dimensional patient, but we're looking at a two-dimensional screen. Our hands are below, our eyes are looking away from the patient, and our foot's tapping on something. It's really like gaming. And so it, it, it's difficult for a lot of people to sort of get that perspective. So what you can do now is you could take these, for example, let's take shoulder surgery. These computers with this new software can watch 15,000 arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs and it learns and then it knows and it sees and it can tell you what you're doing. It can identify the structures up on the screen. It can identify where the best place is to put an anchor in, for example, it then follows you along as you're doing the surgery and can then tell you what you did in the surgery when you were all done with an operative record. It is the most transformative um, you know, tech that I have seen in the world of arthroscopy in 25 years. It's a company mm -hmm. called Caliber AI. Well, and so very, ex and then it's not just arthroscopy, Omar. It's going to go into all of the I was going to say, I was like, gen, 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 general surgery, minimally invasive surgery seems like a great candidate for this. Why, um, and again, I don't know, I know a good amount about AI, but I don't know as much about AI in the orthopedic scope world. Uh, is this the first company that's decided to use AI to this extent, like for arthroscopy? And if so, why, why, why now? Like, why didn't anybody else do it? Well, technology has been so freaking slow to come into the operating room. I mean, like my kid has a smartphone that can do more stuff and control NASA satellites than what we have in the operating room. Everything is wired, right? What yeah. is it these wires, right? And, and all of these things, it's like it just hasn't progressed. And so I was on a surgeon advisory board for one of the largest medical device companies in the world. And we're watching this technique and they're asking us, what do you think of this? And we're all like, oh, my God, that is like so cool. I love that idea. It's going to help me be a better surgeon. It allows me to identify things, be more secure in my decision making. And then one day, my friend Sharif Bechet, who you should interview, he's awesome. He's North Peak surgeon out of Detroit, calls me up. And he's like, Siggy. I found it. I was at this other trade show and he saw what they were looking at. And he's like, we were on the same surgeon advisory board. He's like, that's the thing we were looking at. Cause they don't ever tell you, right. Cause they want you to be blinded to, to what you're looking at. 
the short answer to your question is there's nobody else that I know of that's doing this. And uh, it's about time. It's revolutionary. It is going to be a true game changer in, in arthroscopy. So uh, one of the great things, another great tech device that I'm really excited about uh, is, a, is a company called Gate Science. So we're really oh, great good. Science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Caliber uh, is spelled, is it, it's K. K, 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 L, K, A, L, I, B, E, R, A, I. Got it. Dude, just... you need a producer, man. You need a, you can't be sitting here talking to me and then Googling while I know, we're on man. the show, man. I know. <laughs> you know, like, I need, I need a producer. I need a producer. You need a producer. You need you somebody know? in the background that you can say, yeah, they're, hey, yeah, they're, get you, that for me. What's I know, going on? I know. I need, like, a, who does Joe Rogan have? Joe Rogan has, like, Jamie. Jamie. I need Jamie. Exactly. Yeah, need I, need a Jamie, 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 I need, need a Jamie, man. I need You know what I need to do? Exactly. I need to go I need to go get some sponsorship for this podcast. I should start opening those sponsorship That's... emails. Usually I'm just like not interested, but maybe I should get some no, sponsor gotta, money. Yeah, you got to get a monetized, <laughs> bro. You got to monetize. Yeah, yeah. Who's who's the other but, company uh, you mentioned? The other company I'm excited about is a company called Gate Science. So, one of the things that we're really we've gotten really good at is the management of acute perioperative pain, which means in the first 72 hours We've got a lot of cool tools that have come around in the last decade to avoid opioids and manage pain in that 72 hours. What we're not good at is subacute pain. It's that next six to eight, 10 weeks after surgery where things could still hurt. We use laser in that regard as well, which is a great option. But this company, Gate Science, um, it, it, what they do is they have a catheter that goes, it's going to go into the neck, it can go into any of the nerves that get a regional block. And not only does it allow anesthetic to go through, but it has these little these little electrodes that that send signals back to the nerves that go to the spinal cord that deregulate the signal going from where the pain is to the spinal cord and up to the brain and it's controlled by your smartphone literally you can control when it goes on when it goes off you can increase the frequency somewhat and it stays into the, your zone over here for upwards of four, maybe five weeks after the surgery. And it's a remarkable sort of gap filler for pain management. So a company called Gate Science, which I'm really excited about. Let me ask you a question, Omar. Yeah, so, you can ask me a question. I, I, I mean, you're you're all over this med tech space, man. You are you are the prince of med tech. You know? Man, I, is that, that's, is that... that's, a, that's the first time I've heard that. The prince of med tech, I like that. <laughs> I like the way that I sounds. Knew you <laughs> I knew you would like that. So I get calls probably once a week. Like even this morning, I got a call from the CEO of a startup company. And so literally once a week, you know, based on my relationships that I've built over time, I think I want to set up a fund. I mean, we could jokingly call it the Fro Fund, but it wouldn't be that because it would be, you know, some really amazing people that come together. But it would be six or seven people that are specialists within, within the med tech space, specifically orthopedics is my area where we'd have a couple of orthopedic surgeons that could really identify the technology. We'd bring on a regulatory attorney that understands the space. We'd bring on uh, a, a relationship person that has access to uh, uh, available, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh my God, I'm completely spacing, but Funds? people that can bring the money, yeah, bring yeah. The money to the yeah, table. Yeah. People Thank have you. access to LPs um, and limited partners. Yep. To fund. Yes. And so they understand that process. Bring in like an MBA who understands the due diligence of how you analyze a company on its financials. And then what we're going to do is all that homework to try and analyze and find out which companies are the ones that should be invested. And rather than an individual then having to do all of that work on their own, we do all of that work and then people invest in us uh, as a syndicate or as a, as a, as a mutual fund idea but the idea that people invest in us who have done all of the homework and then we pick and choose uh, the various things. What do you think? Does that, does that sound okay? What, what's your initial impression? No, I think it's a great idea because, I mean, look, just, just from the uh, – I'll speak for like the med tech side. You know, there's plenty of people, let's just take your average rep, who, who – they're making pretty good money. But they don't want to just shovel a bunch of that money into the stock market and the S&P 500. I mean, that's good to do, but you want to diversify a little bit. Most of them don't have access to the one thing that every investor needs, which is deal flow, right? And even if they have access to that deal flow, the, you know, to 
organize the people needed to, you know, cause I do this, I do this with a few people myself. It takes a lot, like we're going to talk to a company tomorrow. It takes a lot of effort. Like we got to find the right clinical person, the right, this person to evaluate and then you make a decision. So if you're able to centralize all that, absolutely. And you already have like a well-trusted brand and name, I'd be interested to be in that fund. You know, I, so I and think so, it's a great so idea. That, now, my I mean, question get, though, is this, is, yeah. Yeah, is, this go. is, is it going to be open I'm guessing you're only going to be able to take like accredited investors for this, or you're going to find a way to take, um, you know, there is actually a way to take uh, unaccredited investors for these kind of things, believe it or not. You know? Yeah. And so we, so, so we've got people on the team for that. You know, I've got an amazing attorney that is out of the PE space, you know, who's familiar with all the mergers and acquisitions and the legal ramifications. And you figure all that out, but you can bring people in, uh, you know, there's probably going to be a minimum to jump on in, but I think about it like, just the other day, I got asked to be on the Surgeon Advisory Board for a company. And, you know, well, we can give you some equity, but we're going to do it as a convertible loan. And it's like a 15-page document. Yeah. It has to be reviewed by an attorney. And then I get the attorney telling me, well, I can't really tell. You know, it's like it, there's these layers and layers of analysis that really need to go through to try and pick winners. And everybody has to remember, there's nobody that picks 100% winners. No, no. But, you know. If you have, if you make five investments and you lose on four and you hit a home run on one, everybody's going to be happy. And so, totally. you know, that's the idea. Bring together a super amazing team diversified across the platform of orthopedics. Each has their own specialty and, and wisdom. Come together and try and identify what are going to be winners for investment long term. I know. I think it's a great idea because at least, you know, I mean – Part of one of the syndicates that that uh, my friend runs that I'm a part of. One of the reasons why people like it is that if they if we present a SaaS company, they say, okay, like so and so evaluated this from this side, Omar evaluated from like the marketing and commercial side, blah blah. And if they if the four of these guys think this is a winner, I'll put money into it. So no, I think it's a great idea. The one question I have is like, are you guys what kind of companies are you guys looking at? Are you looking to fund seed round companies, Series A companies? Like, how early stage are you looking? You know, that's a great question. And that, you know, I just, just like literally this morning was on, on the, on the phone where they're preclinical and they haven't even gone to large animal studies. They're still in rodent studies. That's like obviously a company that's really early on in the process. You know, I think that if I had my druthers, it would be, you know, relatively early, probably not super early, but yet not down the line so that your, your stock is going to be, you know, a, a preferred stock at the right level for the investment you know, purposes. So I would say somewhere, not the earliest startup, just starting out, someone that's, that's like almost proven, but yet maybe not commercialized. I think that's the sweet spot because then if you pick them right and they do well, the ROI happens relatively quickly compared to sitting around waiting for 10 years to get FDA approval for something. Yeah, no, I'm, I think it's a great idea. I, I, I recommend you do it. I think you should go with the Fro Fund to be honest with you. <laughs> like, nobody, well, I don't nobody, want to piss anybody. Off. There's other people involved too, but it could be fun. <laughs> I mean, it could be the ortho fund. I don't know. Yeah, you yeah, know. So the, yeah, we'll figure something. I mean, out, I but, think you guys uh, should definitely do it because I mean, just me in my own program, I can think of like two orthopedic companies that are seed stage. You know, it takes money to take a medical device to market, and so there's a lot of really damn good companies out there that your average VC, like most venture capitalists are kind of pushovers. Like it, what they, what they will never admit is that they can only get in at seed, seed level companies because when it comes to growth companies, they're not well known enough to, for a founder to be like, yeah, I'll take your money. Cause at that stage, a founder's like, no, I'm going to take money from Andreessen Horowitz or Sequoia or something. Why would I like take your money? So uh, I think these companies, there's, there's a spot where a fund like this could really help really amazing technology make it to market and make a huge difference in patient lives and at the same time make a difference in somebody's you know wallet like well, there's nothing wrong with that i think it's a win win for everybody i i couldn't have said it better myself for sure well dr sigmund look really appreciate it as we kind of wrap up uh, where can people follow you and then you know closing closing remarks we're going to have you back on because you know as a repeat guest as always but like just some closing closing thoughts and remarks and then where can people follow you well the the easiest place to find me is just turn on your computer because it won't take long before my face shows up somewhere that's right you know, you know if you're into the linkedin space i'm there all the time always commenting uh, always appreciative of the amazing people that i have relationships with such as umr is how you and i have met 
certainly also on Instagram and and, uh, and Facebook. I don't tweet. Uh, there's too many haters on the planet for me there. Um, <laughs> so that's where that's where you find me. But look, I mean, look, I'm so happy to have rekindled, you know, with you, Omar. It's been a while. Uh, I, I love all of your energy and the great things that you're doing, the influencing that you do. Uh, and for me in particular, you know, as I, what I would say is, you know, right now my greatest passion is ortho laser and being able to get these lasers out and be able to treat people and, and be able to make a difference in their lives. And as my uh, senior marketing person said to me the other day, hey, Scott, in a perfect world, you know, where do you see, you know, what's the exit for, for ortho laser? And I'm like, how about at every single Walmart across the country where anybody that walks in and gets their glasses or their vaccine can go over and get treatment as well? So all hands on deck, opioid alternatives, crush this opioid epidemic, and anything that I can do to make that happen. That's fantastic. I love it. Dr. Sigmund, thank you so much. For those who are listening, I'm going to leave Dr. Sigmund's uh, links in the show notes below. Please go give him, a, give him a follow. Go check out his podcast, The Ortho Show. If you're a company, by the way, don't waste your money on a stupid bus strap at a conference. Go sponsor an episode at The Ortho Show. I guarantee you'll get a lot more out of that than like any bus wrap at, an, at a conference. So that being said, I'm your host, Omar Khatib. This is another episode of the State of MedTech, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of The State of MedTech. I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib. Do us a favor. If you like this episode, share with somebody and go ahead on Apple and Spotify, wherever you are, leave a five-star review. Type a few nice notes about us. This is how we get other people to find the show. Thank you. We'll see you next time. 